did you transition from caddying for the likes of Eric Fraser, Alan Jones? How did you transition into the into the professional caddying ranks and 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 doing it for for bigger money and and, and moving abroad? Yeah, well, first of all, I, you know, we, there used to be a lot of prams around the place. Uh, 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 you know, there was one at Parapara Beach, and Levin had one, Otaki had one. We had prams. There seemed to be a lot of prams. Now, you just, as a kid, you just go along to some of these taunts and, 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 and you know, carry the, or push the trundle of a pro, like, you know, carry for Barry, Vivian, Craig Owen, Simon Owen at these pram tournaments right. and that, and just to get a bit of knowledge and a bit of experience. But, um through that Nick DePaul, I mean, I, you know, I realised he told me exactly what I got to do. So, um, you know, I came for Peter in New Zealand here, and then I went over and came from the Australian Open, um, and just it sort of started from there. You know, I was only a kid. I went and came for Peter at the at the Australian Golf Club. I was fourteen years of old. Same thing. My, I got billed at the, as a member there, and right. um, you know, from there, I just I, I just worked out how you did it. I mean. It was not not as difficult as it seemed. It's just uh, you know it was a bit intimidating to travel overseas as a youngster, um, but there was no problem getting getting bags and that. It was it was quite you know it, was what, it wasn't like today. You, you, if you turned up at a golf tournament, you'd never get a bag, but there wasn't as many caddies around, so it was easy to get to a golf tournament. You just um, familiarise yourself with the players who are the better players, and you know just get a job. And at that stage, I mean, were you looking? Were you looking at Europe? Were you looking at America? I mean, did you have things mapped out in front of you? Did you say, "Hey, I want to go and caddy for that guy one day"? I mean, did no, Steve look, Williams I, set goals and have plans? Yeah, look, look, my my father was instrumental in in telling me, you know, whatever you do, you do it to the best of your ability. Um, and he, you know, for, as a youngster, I was always fit. Um, it, 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 I used to run from Pukaroo Bay round to Plimpton, round the foreshore there, uh, mm. countless times a week and take the train back, you know, time it, you know, had to try and leave home at this particular time to get this particular train. And then if you could, if you could run fast, you'd have enough time to stop at the dairy and get an ice cream before you got on that train. So that was an enticement to run faster. So I was always fit. And my, you know, my father was instrumental in telling me, you know, if you st- keep yourself fit, keep yourself sh- sharp, um, you know, you, you'll, do, you'll do well at whatever you do. But I just wanted to be a caddy to start off with. But so, as soon as I got into it, um, you know, I envisaged that at some point I wanted to caddy in America. But it was, very, it's a close, it was a closed shop to get into America. You know, the, it, I was one of the first foreign caddies to actually work there legally, <laughs> um, which may seem strange, um, but it was true. I mean, I actually spent the time it was costly to get a green card uh, to, a, as a golf caddy which i managed to do um most guys were working there illegally and and, and a lot of guys that were working there uh immigration would come to the golf course a couple of times a year and, and do like a raid sort of thing and those guys that were caught working illegally you know spent two to five years where they couldn't come back to america but i was fortunate from day one that i went there uh, I did it properly, so I was able to carry there. But, um, you know, things transpired very quickly. You know, I went to Europe to start off with and, you know, carry for, you know, just week to week carrying for different players. That's how it used to go back then. You sort of, you know, you carry for a guy and you for a few weeks and there was no such thing as a permanent job sort of thing. And if one guy came along and gave you a better offer, you moved on. You know, it wasn't sort of the loyal thing that, that evolved in, in, in years to come by. But... I came for a number of players, Michael King. Um, the, actually, the very first guy I came for in the very first tournament I came for in the UK it was at the Lawrence Batley International, and of course, for Bingley St. Eves. Uh, I came for Noel Rackliffe, an Australian journeyman guy. I think I came for him for one or two weeks. And, you know, you just move. And then I came for Ian Baker Finch for a little, little while, came back to Australia and came for Ian Baker Finch. And during that time, it was about 1980. Um, caring for Baker Finch and some tournaments in Australia that he was paired with Greg Norman and Greg um, took a liking to what I was doing and, and you know so I started caring for Greg um, and, and I started caring for Greg and everywhere he played except the United States he had a caddy in the United States and I had no work visa and that and after caring for Greg for a, a couple of years uh, I, I was under the impression that it was probably better for me to carry just for him outside of the United States because he was a pretty tough character <laughs> um, to caddy for 
Um, and, and of course, I'm, I'm young at this stage. Um, when, when I started caring for Greg, I'm 17 years old. And he, he was a hard taskmaster. And, you know, I, I was quick to realize that, you know, it was probably, like I said, in my best interest just to care for him. He played a lot in Asia, Europe, and Japan, and, and Australia. And it was great. He used to, I mean, I think, you know, if I carried from for 50 tournaments in Australia, he probably won 45 of them. I mean, he was, in his prime, he was hard to beat in Australia. And he played a lot in Australia. And it suited me down to the ground. It was great. But um, eventually he took me into caring for him in America. Um, and, um, yeah, it was, look, he's a great guy, but, you know, he, he's one of the hardest guys to carry for. And, and it's a, it was a known fact on the tour that, you know, he was a hard guy to carry for, Greg. And, yeah. um, you know, unfortunately, or fortunately, have you look at it, it only lasted a couple of years caring for him full time in America. Um, but, you know, things transpired and I learned a lot from caring for him. Um, I, look, I, I would never have had never like going from the likes of Peter Thompson and some of these, you know, lesser known pros to care for someone like Greg Norman. He, he, he actually taught me mo more about the game than anyone else I cared for. Um, you know, the, he, he was the best driver of the golf ball with the wooden driver. Well, you know, it's a world-class driver of the golf ball, but he was, he was great. He treated me like a son and, and almost like an apprentice, if you like. And he explained to me how you hit the shot, why I hit the shot, how, why the ball comes out like this. And he was absolutely fantastic, Kay, for from that perspective. But on the golf course, he was, you know, he was a hard man um, to caddy for. So, but, you know, thing, things moved on and, you know, I went straight away from caddying for him. Uh, we, we, he let me go in a tournament in Japan. I, we sort of had a massive argument on the golf course in Japan. Um, and that was the end of that. And, you know, two weeks later, I was caring for Raymond Floyd. You know, so, I mean, one thing opened, you know, Greg, a number of years later, just absolutely begged me to come back and caddy for him. Um, but I, I, I grasped quickly that loyalty was important as a caddy. And Raymond Floyd was great to caddy for as well, and a completely different player, as you can imagine. A very, um, a very consistent sort of player, a very down the middle, you know, not non aggressive sort of player um, compared to Greg. Just everything was different about Raymond, but um, he was a wonderful guy to caddy for and had such a, an amazing um, technique very unorthodox technique and he was famous for what you know the Raymond Floyd glare or the steer they used to call it and that and when he you know when he used to get into the zone I, I could see that and he was quite an amazing guy to watch play he's so unorthodox but he he he, 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 he believed you'd say things to me like Steve get right beside me here and will that ball in the hole you can will it in the hole doesn't matter what sort of stroke you put on it you can will it in the hole <laughs> right right it's interesting uh, we interviewed um uh, Paul Devonport a couple of weeks ago, and he found himself in the 93 Australian Open, I understand, uh, teeing it up with, with Raymond Floyd. And he said he just yeah, had it to... Was it was at Metro. I was counting for Raymond. Yeah, he, he mentioned, he mentioned I remember, that. I, yeah, I, I remember the day vividly. Paul was so nervous. Yeah. And um, you know, going off the, first, off the first tee, he was just so nervous. I remember talking to him, saying, hey, mate, look, it's just, yeah, it's just another golf tournament. This guy's just another player in that. You know, watch and learn, but you know, pay attention to your own game because I could see straight away he was he was more worried about what, what Rain was doing. But I remember that day distinctly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he he said that as well, and he had to stop himself from actually spectating Raven Floyd's game. He, he said it was incredible. They got to a a par three. It might be the eighth hole, and 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 Raymond Floyd hit this three iron. He said it was the highest, softest three iron he's ever seen. It just sat down on the green and and. Paul's watching and thinking, well, if he's hit a three iron, I better hit a four iron, and he kind of blew it through the back. He just said he played a he played a different game, and he absolutely loved watching him that day. Um, just stepping back, I mean, you you you, um, you know, you, you you mentioned earlier you caddied for Eric Fraser, a, a lovely gentleman who I've had the the good fortune of, of spending a little bit of time at the club. He's he's still with us, and um, nowadays he just comes down for a little uh, a little pint of beer. Um, but he, he made a he made an observation about about yourself even way back then as I think you were twelve years old when you were caddying for him. He said, "If Steve Williams told you to hit a seven iron, you hit that seven iron. You didn't dare argue with him." And 
<laughs> and he goes, Leo, he said he was only 12 years of age. Now, we've also spoken to, to Mike Clayton, who you caddied for um, up in Europe. And and uh, he said the first week you caddied for him, you were, you were having a, uh, a walk to the practice range and you, you had a little conversation with him. Do you remember that? Yeah, actually, uh, you know, Mike and I always joke about that because, you know, a lot of times you, when you're canning on the tour and you see other players, you wonder why they don't do better. But, the, and the, but then you sort of can paint a picture of why they don't do better. And Mike Clayton was a tremendous striker of the golf ball, but he, he was a real character and he seemed to be always laughing and joking and not taking it so seriously. So I remember telling them on the way to the first tee, I believe it was, that something like, look, for 72 holes, I'd just like you to concentrate from the first hole to the 72nd hole and, 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 and try and concentrate. You don't, you don't appear to me like you concentrate. So, something along those lines. I remember telling them, just for 72 holes, see what you can do. And um, that was our first week out together. And from memory, he shot like 61. It was in, okay, in yeah, the south that? of France, in fact, of Beer uh, He shot an unbelievable round. He won the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was his only uh, victory up in Europe, so... <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, wonderful player, and uh, yeah, one one of those you know, one of those guys that you you see in, in later years when I always saw him. You know, great guy to catch up with. You know, a, a wonderful knowledge of the game. Mike had yeah. like great memory. You know, like a I don't think I've probably come across anyone with uh, like a professional golfer with, with this, such a deep knowledge of the game as Mike had, and it was like a really good guy to to talk to. So how important in your caddying has, has that forthright personality been, that ability to, to I guess, you know, you're, you're working for someone. Mike's the boss. As Mike said, he was 26 years of age. You were only 20. But here you are telling him to clear his mind and to concentrate and to hit the clubs that you give him. You know, how important have you, have you found it that, you know, that, that forthright attitude towards your players? Yeah, well, look, I mean, that's, you know, everybody that I've caddied for would tell you the same thing. That's that's my trait, if you like. Um, if I caddy it to 7 I mean, you hit the 7-9 sort of thing. Um, but that, that, that's, that trait has been built on thorough preparation. Um, I, I've taken extensive amount of notes from every player that I caddy for. Uh, and that dates back to my days at Parapanamu Beach. I used to have a little notebook, and they... Little I like remember a little um, orange notebook, <laughs> and I used to have the players that I'd care for in that book. There was like a handful of players, like I said, there was Dick Warren, um, Alan James, Colin Wilson, Eric Fraser, Mighty Mouse, we used to call him, and yeah. and, I, and I'd keep notes, you know, what they'd hit off the second hole, off the fifth hole, the fourteenth hole, the sixteenth hole, from this bush here, from this tree. You know, I used to write all this stuff down. That's how I. You know, I didn't know how far it was. Um, I, you know, they they didn't have those plaques in the ground that they do now. You know, the, there was just sprinkler heads and, and various other things. But I used to write all these things down. So even though I didn't actually know how far it was, I knew from that point to this point, this guy hits an eight iron in normal conditions. And I'd write all this stuff down. And that's what I did when I first started caddying. I just kept a thorough knowledge of everything, the player that I was caddying for, you know, what was he feeling you know what was his mood that day um and how did he warm up on the range that day and all this sort of stuff and, and you, you, you ended up with a picture of everything they did and you could you could see what was coming before it came come along you, you sort of i knew when a guy was going to play well or when he wasn't going to play well you, you know i just i wrote so much stuff down um some would say probably too much but you know a, a lot of caddies get so f more focused on the, on the yardages. So I was the exact opposite. Yardages were just a guideline to me. Um, it was more about the psychology about it and, and, and trying to say the right thing and that. But my forthright came from, because you know, I, I, I had so much information. And as everyone's always been aware with me when I caddy, I'm always walking. I've got a long stride and I walk quicker than anyone. And the reason why I developed that was, that when I always when I wanted when I got to the golf ball, I wanted to get to that golf ball before the player did. So when he got to that golf ball, I told him everything he needed to know without any uncertainty in my voice and any doubt. So there was never any doubt. He, I painted the picture so clearly. There was, you know, I just say that whatever it was, and by walking quickly. So when you know when I would leave the tee, 
and I'm approaching the ball from a certain, you know, from 100 yards out, I would have the yards down within 10. And then from 50 yards out, I've got it down with five because I can see that sprinkler is that far or that tree's that far, however it might be. You know, and as I got to the golf ball, I had the exact thing. The player would be, you know, 20, 30 metres behind me. And then when he come up to the there, I'd tell him exactly everything. And, and I'd already got seen the shot that was needed to be hit, the flight that needed to be hit, and the club that's going to be hit. And that's how I, that's, that's how I developed that forthright confident attitude, if you like.